Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for joining us here this morning. Uh, we are honored. We are honored to have amongst us uh, the Honorable Minister for Commerce and Industry. Uh, he's, he's been a strong supporter of, of FIKI all along and of the entire work he does for the country. We are honored that he's joined us for the inaugural this morning. Thank you, sir. May I now request Ms. Nanalal Kidwai, President FIKI, to present a green certificate to the chief guest. In typical FIKI tradition, we set up a bouquet of flowers, we give a bouquet of trees. Uh, trees will be planted in the Honorable Minister's name at a sanctuary outside Delhi. Thank you, sir. May I now invite Ms. Nanalal Kidwai, President Fiki, to deliver the presidential address. Honorable Minister for Commerce and Industry, Sriyanan Sharma, Siddharth Birla, President elect, Fiki, Jyotsna Suri, Vice President, Fiki. Didar Singh, Secretary General Fiki, and the talented team at Fiki, members of the Diplomatic Corps, senior government officials, members of the Fiki National Executive Committee, colleagues from industry from across India, members of media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and welcome to the 86th Annual General Meeting of Fiki. The last two years, had been particularly difficult for the Indian economy. And it is imperative that we get back to the 8 to 9 percent growth mark. As the finance minister, Mr. Chidambaram, only in March, and frankly from industry, we heard this with a sense of relief. He announced in the budget, growth is a necessary condition and we must unhesitatingly embrace growth as the highest goal. It is growth that will lead to inclusive development. Without growth, there will be neither development nor inclusiveness. So what is the impetus of this growth? What drives the Indian economy? And here I'm reminded of a statement that Winston Churchill once made. The empires of the future will be the empires of the mind. His words particularly, I think, resonate now in the age of the knowledge economy. And all of us here are familiar with the way the IT and BPO sectors have grown in India. And in this industry has raised our profile to the global level. It has become our best known strengths, where IT and BPO are pretty much synonymous with what India is seen as. How did this come to be? In fact, Thomas Friedman, the economist, traces it to the 1990s when a combination of India's excess of highly skilled technology workers and an abundance of fiber optics, so infrastructure, converged to give India an edge in the technology market. And he, in fact, cites this as one of those events that flattened the world, creating a more level global economic level playing field. So, what is the next disruptive wave for us? Could it be agriculture and food processing? As we are already amongst the largest food processors in the world, the largest milk producers, second largest fruit and vegetable producers. After all, land and water are a scarce resource, and yet our productivity in agriculture as a huge user of these resources is substandard. Or could it be in energy or the water sector as we need to devise innovative solutions in terms of utilization of these twin shortages. Or maybe in the export sector, as China vacates some of this space. We need to look into the future, identify the potential wave beforehand, and build a supportive ecosystem in order to get that next disruptive wave into action. FIKI has prepared vision documents for key sectors which tell us what the industry should look like in the next 10 to 20 years and what steps we need to take to reach there. 
We need to work together to achieve this. Now let me now turn to another important segment of our economy, the manufacturing sector. Fiki published the manufacturing handbook four months ago. The government has come out with an agenda also for the sector. But we are far from progressing at the pace we should. What we need essentially is an enabling environment that encourages more investments in the manufacturing sector. I think it's significant here to reflect on what Nelson Mandela said. Money won't create success. The freedom to make it will. So these days, we speak about investments and India, and there's a general mood of despondency. We do need to remind ourselves that our consumer market is growing. We are on course to become the fifth largest consumer market in the world by 2025. There's a huge demand for auto, consumer durables, FMCG, pharma, textiles, housing, telecom equipment, and the list can go on as our population gets more prosperous and seeks to fulfill its aspirations. And this explains why many companies from across the world, whether GSK, Unilever, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Hitachi, Hyundai, Samsung, Toyota, just to name a few, remain committed to the Indian market and see India's attractiveness as an investment destination. And it is no surprise that the highest investments this year are from Unilever, 3.2 billion, and GSK, in fact, just announced another billion dollars over the billion they brought in in January. So these companies all know India well and therefore see the opportunity. In fact, not all of you may know, the latest global Ernst & Young survey ranks India as the most attractive investment destination followed by Brazil and China. In terms of investments, USA, France, and Japan are the top three investors most likely to invest in India, according to this survey. The sectors most likely to attract deals include auto, technology, life sciences, and consumer products. And this was across a slew of Fortune 500 companies. There are a number of other factors that impact India's economic fortunes, including our relationship with other countries. The dynamics in Asia, for instance, are changing. Japan is actively investing in India, and India has repeatedly come up as a preferred choice for Japanese multinationals. China and India, too, are finding more and more ways to collaborate, as the recent visit of our Prime Minister to China highlighted. We are deepening our connects with countries of the ASEAN region, as well as the BRICS countries. The work being done by FIKI as part of institutional arrangements, arrangements like the India ASEAN Business Council and the BRICS Business Council highlight the development of different groupings where India is the key player. And we have all seen how critical India was in the WTO deliberations in Bali, so ably led by Minister Sharma. Now, another key driver for growth is innovation. And this does not only reside in the high-end R&D labs of large corporates. So let's take the case of a well-known story, the Dabbawalas. This simple service, familiar to all of us in Mumbai, is a model of efficiency and efficacy and actually of the Indian work ethos. One of the keys to the system's success, in fact, is a code of colored symbols which has been learned and memorized by what is largely an illiterate Dabbawala force. And the system is astoundingly accurate. So accurate that the Forbes magazine awarded them a Six Sigma rating, an accuracy of 99.9999%. This translates only into one missing dabba per six million delivered. If this sounds a bit familiar as a business model, one dabbawala explained to a reporter, there is a service called FedEx that is similar to ours, but they don't deliver lunch. Yeah? So, so what I think this illustrates is how Indian business innovates, makes extraordinary use of available resources and commodities. And the philosophy which is best enshrined in the words of Tagore, as you know, India's first, first Nobel laureate in literature, if I can't make it through one door, I'll go through another door, or I'll make a door. A little like the Delhi driver. So. So we can see the effects of innovation on accessibility. The world's lowest telecom costs resulted in increased cellular phone use. 
world's cheapest car, or let's say value car, Tata's Nano, made headlines around the globe and is seen as a turning point in the global auto industry. The benefits of business innovation permeate all levels of Indian society. So here again, we need to ensure that we create and maintain and grow the enabling environment so that this can facilitate employment opportunities, directly or indirectly. So just in healthcare, I was think, looking at what are the innovations we have, and just taking one industry, let alone all the others, if you look at this, Jaipur Foot, recognized by Time magazine in 2009, is one of the world's 50 best innovations. 99% of the patients are below the poverty line. Or Arvind Eye Care, which delivers cataract operations and one-sixth of the cost of an Indian hospital, one-thirtieth of the cost of a USA hospital. In 2003, they became the single largest cataract surgery provider in the world. In 2003, or Narayan Hrudale, which has perfected a low-cost approach to heart surgery at half the cost of an Indian hospital, one-sixteenth the cost in the U.S. Forbes has just listed India as the 39th in uh, innovation among 145 countries. So we rank pretty high, something to be proud of. FIKI has highlighted solutions across industries earlier this year when we partnered with the Ministry of Finance to organize a seminar on the theme Innovation for Inclusion during the 46th annual meeting of the Board of Governors of ADB that India hosted. And our flagship Millennium Alliance project with USAID and the Department of Science and Technology Government of India has been a great success, helped in bringing to the fore solutions aimed at addressing India's development challenges. Now let me now touch upon some of the key economic challenges that have been bothering us for a while now. Inflation. We have seen this has been a perennial problem for the last three years. Food inflation particularly has been very high, driving up overall price levels. RBI has been proactive in ensuring that the situation does not go out of hand. However, a tight monetary policy stance has led to high interest rates, something Fiki has been speaking up a lot about. And this has adversely impacted industrial growth and the investment cycle in the country. Additionally, our companies clearly operate in an environment where considerable time and resources are spent on dealing with regulations. And this was acknowledged just yesterday in the panel of secretaries that addressed us. All of us know that in terms of ease of doing business, India ranks 134 out of 189 countries as per World Bank on certain standard parameters. So procedural reforms are as important, if not more important, than policy reform. Our businesses are expanding, but imagine how well they could do if the ease of process of setting up or indeed running day-to-day -day business were better. If we could unleash the entrepreneurial spirit I just talked about among professionals so that people with ideas and vision could follow their dreams. It was also therefore important for us to address this. There is of course the problem of infrastructure, huge deficit here and a huge area for us to focus on. And we are, of course, today engaged in developing some very large and ambitious projects like, like DMIC. And I must congratulate Minister for staying on the course to ensure that large projects such as these corridors, the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor and others come into place, because these will provide the building blocks for our growth in the future. At FIKI, we have evolved a comprehensive economic agenda that touches upon some of these issues and which the minister will be releasing in a short while from now. While I will not go into the details here, I'd like to flag a few priorities. First, dealing with food inflation, which calls for a quantum jump in food productivity, straightening out the kinks in agri-supply and distribution, reducing wastage, we need to have a second green revolution that focuses on fruit and vegetables, meat, fish, eggs, milk, milk products. We need an effective coal chain and warehousing infrastructure. Second, for reducing the cost of doing business in India and in fact enhancing government revenue too, we must usher in a comprehensive goods and service tax. We need one common market in India. Third, speedier implementation of infrastructure projects 
And while the CCI, the Cabinet Committee of Investments, has done a commendable job in clearing large projects, we need to now see that these go into production. Fourth, the administration of the tax system in the country requires a mindset change. As long as actions are driven by a single point agenda of maximizing revenue today, we will sacrifice revenue tomorrow. We will always be drawn towards litigation. We need to bridge the gap between interpretation and intent of law. We need clearer laws. Over 70% of litigation cases in India involve the government as either a petitioner or a respondent. This, in effect, makes government the largest litigant in the country. This situation must change. Fifth, the issue of energy security, where we are actually making some progress. We must follow on our diversification strategy in terms of sources of energy, as well as the geographies from where we source these. We need to accept the fact that coal will be the mainstay of our energy mix. And in the foreseeable future, we therefore need to evolve policies that help us tap this resource, not shut it off completely, as we had done. Sixth, land is essential for industrial expansion, and our land-related policies should ensure that this resource is available to industry on a long-term basis and with certainty. Seventh, allocation of natural resources, which has been the subject of intense discussion. The Supreme Court ruling, in fact, mentions that auction cannot be the only mechanism, although it's a preferred mechanism. Fiki believes the process of allocation of natural resources should be transparent, predictable, and there should be a justifiable balance between revenue optimization and socioeconomic development objectives. The rules then need to be followed, action taken promptly when rules are broken. We need regulatory frameworks which look into the long-term profitability of the industry while protecting consumer interests. Eighth, businesses require an environment of predictability that can only be ensured if there is sanctity of contract, stability in the tax regime, and applicability of legislations prospectively. There have, as we all know, developments in the past when one or more of these principles has been violated. Government has taken corrective measures in some of the cases, but one must recognize that bringing confidence back can be a long, drawn-out process. Our businesses have a long history of engagement with communities around them, and many understand what is good for the community is good for business. Entrepreneurs, therefore, need to be treated fairly and with respect. We should be part of the collective effort involving both the government and civil society that is aimed at realizing the true potential of India. So at FIKI, we've set up the Inclusive Governance Council to address some of these issues and bring government, industry, and civil society onto a common platform. And some of our members of this council are here with us today. We reaffirm our commitment to work with the government and civil society to ensure that we always adhere to the highest standards of corporate citizenship. As you are aware, FIKI's foundation was built on the tenet of trusteeship, and we draw our inspiration from Gandhiji, at whose instance FIKI was set up. He called upon our founding fathers to set up the federation to make Indian entrepreneurs an integral part of our struggle for economic freedom as a country. We need to work together, find solutions through balance and compromise. Finally, before I come to the close of my address, I'd like to point out that while it is necessary to address the structural and economic problems that we face, it is important to recognize that there are social issues that have to be dealt with as well. We need to work to protect the pluralism that is India, to ensure an inclusive India in all we do. I would particularly like to highlight the role of women in society and business. We need to embrace the cause of the safety of women at the workplace. I hope that all of you that run businesses have introduced the guidelines that we had issued earlier this year into your companies in this regard. Let me also ask, are your daughters as eligible as your sons to run your businesses? 
may the best person succeed, man or woman. As I come to the close of my presidency at FIKI, I would like to thank Sid and Jyotsna for your support. I also express my gratitude to all the chairs and co-chairs of FIKI's several committees for the tremendous work you are doing in your respective areas. And of course, a special thanks is due to all my colleagues in the FIKI Secretariat, so ably led by our Secretary General, Didar Singh. May you take FIKI to greater heights with your commitment and efforts. To quote from an old Sanskrit shlok, and I end here, Maha Stavira Sangarakshita. To know what we do not know is the beginning of wisdom. I do not know what the future holds for us. I do not know what the elections next year mean for us. Yeah. What I do know is the trajectory is ours to make. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. I wanted the privilege of introducing our minister, uh, and hence I'm here back at the dais. He does not need introduction, but before he makes his inaugural address to us today, on behalf of Fiki, sir, let me once again congratulate you for playing a remarkable role in closing a landmark deal at Bali at the WTO Ministerial. Yeah. Yeah. The first ever since the WTO was set up in 1995. Honorable Minister, we are delighted and proud of your exemplary readership, your determination to protect India's interests and the fine skill you displayed for building a broad coalition of support at the ministerial. You have strengthened India's position in the multilateral trading system and the institution of the WTO, and in fact established India as a leader and spokesperson for the developing world. Your deft handling of the difficult negotiation dynamics, and we were getting pretty much hourly reports from there, have earned well-deserved accolades. It's a great achievement that you have been able to successfully safeguard the legitimate concerns of India on food security, while enabling the trade facilitation advantages to come through. Minister Anand Sharma, you did it. Yeah. Yes, he deserves a big hand for this. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present to you Sri Anand Sharma, our chief guest today, our Honorable Union Minister for Commerce and Industry. Thank you. Uh, before Minister delivers his address, we'll just request him to release what Nana just referred to as our economic agenda, uh, which we are we have worked on and, and prepared. It's an honor to have him release it on behalf of FIKI. Thank you very much, sir. Maybe kindly have your inaugural address. Thank you, sir. The President of FIKI, Nana Kidwai, President-elect Siddharth Pilla, Jyotsna Suri, Secretary-General Didas Singh, 
पास प्रेसिडेंट्स ऑफ फिक्की वाई के ओंकार सरोज पदार हबील हर्ष राजन हरीश मारीवाला एंड राजू कनौरिया आई डोंट सी एम हेयर ही वॉज हेयर वाई एम एड्रेसिंग द पास वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज एज वी टॉक ऑफ द प्रेजेंट वी हैव टू इम्बाइब वन थिंग एंड वी ऑफ दोज हु डू सो आर फॉर्चुनेट दैट द प्रेजेंट इज ट्रांसजेंट एंड टेम्परेरी द पास इज स्टेबल एंड परमानेंट and i'm sure i'm not saying anything that we would like to be known as past but one day we all will be <laughs> having said that let me thank nana for a leadership that she gave to the fiki dynamism vision and i'm very happy and proud to have worked very closely with nana and fiki and all the leaders of the industry discussing reflecting looking at where india is today what are the real issues and what are the challenges we have been able to forge a very close understanding and a enriching partnership between the government and the industry i feel if india has to continue to in its journey to move forward to find its rightful place in the committee of the nations to ensure inclusive growth and sustainable development this partnership has to be strengthened we have in the past been victims of a mindset where the industry and the entrepreneurs who create wealth who reinvest wealth create opportunities and create jobs were kept at a arms length from government from administration but today it's a different india today's india believes in forging these bonds in benefiting from the wisdom of those who have stepped out either those who have inherited businesses and continued with the tradition but many of the first generation entrepreneurs who actually have written their own essay in the india story as we all know and i would like to say that we are proud of you as a nation and we are with you <coughs> when you express your concerns and we understand what those challenges are when we are talking of india on the move yes this nation has constantly been on the move we are a civilizational country but a young nation of 1.25 billion people majority of our people are young our sons and daughters they have their aspirations and they have their dreams since 1991 <coughs> when we embarked on the path of economic reforms embracing liberalization engaging with the world much has changed in india it was not that india was frozen in the past before 1991 but it's a big change in the world with which india connected after the end of the cold war the collapse of the soviet union the very firm assertion of democracy and the shared values that we have with other democracy of a commitment to growth to liberty and those values which are fundamental in recognizing and respecting human dignity and human rights indian entrepreneurs stepped out with confidence and india opened up the rest is known to all of you if you look at the previous industrial revolutions two to be precise they were different when india africa 
Latin America, these big regions of the world were left out. There was a global growth, industrialization, waves of technology not benefiting a vast majority of the people of the world. Today it is different. Today we have connected and countries similarly placed, including Africa and Latin Americas, with what's happening in the world. We are not excluded, we are participants and we are co-authors of the new story being written of global growth. We are jointly addressing the challenges which the world faces. But what has happened in an age when technologies are redefining how businesses are done, global value chains are being created, we live in an information age and a knowledge era. This country has very well connected to that. Why? Is it the Indian mind? Is the newfound confidence? Answer is, lies in both. Because this is the country which always had the mind. This is the country which gave zero to the world. Now zero is very positive. This is how you move. If you do it anti-clockwise, it can become very destructive. But as long as you move in the right direction, nothing moves without the shunya. And therefore, when the new technology revolution came, information technology, communication technology, India was able to connect and bridge the big divide which had left us behind because we were not free nations, we were colonies, we were subjugated. And I give the credit to our institutions and the investment which India had made in those institutions soon after independence despite the paucity of resources, creating some of the finest in Indian institutes of technology, Indian institutes of management, Indian institutes of science, nuclear science, space science, all were set up because of the vision of one of the greatest, tallest leaders of the Indian national movement, Jawaharlal Nehru. If you move around this India Gate area, when you look at the various institutions, whether fine arts, whether the museum, Saitya Kala Academy, it's not only one area, every aspect was touched. National Institute of Design, only one came up, now we are establishing four more in Ahmedabad. How can India not connect with this reality that it didn't happen abruptly? We had men and women who were going out during a period when opportunities were not there, that was the period of brain drain, as we used to call it. Today, the reverse cycle is on. That is important. If we didn't have, if we had not invested in what I refer to, India wouldn't be what India is. And now we are doing much more, more than doubling. That has happened. This country has vision, so much of growth, the developed countries of the world never saw doubling of national incomes within a decade. India, China have demonstrated the fastest doubling of national incomes in the history of the economic growth and development in the, since the industrial age has happened in our countries. That is the truth. Now, if that is correct, there is need to pause and reflect. We are we going wrong? As Naina said, despondency, gloom. These are worrisome signs. We cannot be in denial. But we need to be correct in our comprehension. Then only we will be in a position to respond in adequate measure, to invoke correctives where they are required, and to correct the perception where we feel the perception is not correct. It's important. Since 2010, we had a great visit of a great leader of a great country, Barack Obama, United States of America's president. 
and you know his election and the wisdom of the American people. India was one country which applauded. It resonated throughout the world as democracies respect what democracies decide. Soon after that, the narrative changed. I still fail to understand. I recall the meetings in Mumbai and in Delhi and the address of the US President Obama to the Indian Parliament. Immediately after that, nothing to do with that visit, by the way, if anybody gets me wrong, we had a very shrill and negative discourse in India. And the drum beats got louder and louder. Maybe there were issues. Maybe they were not. Time will tell. We all got carried away. Every institution got targeted. Every decision became suspect. Governance became difficult. We were tired of listening the word here and outside, policy paralysis. And I said, what? Where is the paralysis? I can say emphatically in India there was never a policy paralysis. Major decisions were made during this difficult period. Ever since the economic crisis engulfed the world, there has been downturn, there has been contraction. Look where India has been. Yes, we were not growing at 9% plus. We were dragged down. We can't be insulated from what happens in the world, in a globalized world, interdependent, interconnected. But did we show resilience? The answer is yes. We went back to 8.5%, almost 9 again slipped. They're global factors. They're national factors too. Global factors, we all have to work collectively, wishing the countries well in the Eurozone and the good news of the strong growth returning in the United States of America. The strong growth taking place in Africa, in Latin America. These are positives. But during this period, of so-called policy paralysis and this shrill narrative and overactivism. I don't blame. Democracies are always noisy. We perhaps became too noisy, and we are. Sometimes, you know, the, we are talking of environment and pollution. This, then sound also affects the environment sometimes. It's too much. That's why there's ban on loud music after 10 p.m. or something. So we have to take care of that for the health of the country, country's mental health, country's self-confidence. We must not allow any situation, and it is the collective shared responsibility of all of us. It includes not only the elected leadership, the political leadership, yes, the corporate leaders, the bureaucrats, our civil servants, and also the media and the judiciary. Our biggest achievement after our independence has been that from day one, unlike many other democracies, we gave universal suffrage, that's the voting right to every Indian citizen, man, woman, rich or poor. Democracy has been India's strength. A democracy which is representative and inclusive. A democracy which is rule-based and rule-governed. A constitutional democracy. Constitution also has a separation of powers between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. The Constitution of India cannot be redefined either by me or by anyone else. This separation of powers, I would urge everyone must respect and not be confused. The issues of governance must be left to those who are accountable directly to the people, who are elected by the people. If people are not happy with the decisions made, with the policy initiatives, people will throw them out. But let this not be a daily agenda. Let the governments function and deliver on their promises and commitments and leave it to the wisdom of 800 million Indian voters who will judge and decide. It cannot be a daily judgment daily indictment. There's need in this country, I agree, 
to cut out red tape. Because when there is a delay, I understand, delay means what? We make people petition, we make people wait, we make investments wait, the cost of investment rise, but I also know red tape and delay means corruption. If somebody is rent seeking somewhere. We have tried to eliminate that. And I can say very proudly, in my ministry, in DGFT is the most e-enabled organization in the country today. This is all electronic. We have connected all ports, terminals. There's no physical filing, there's no physical interface. Anything you need, and those who are connected would know. But I'm not saying we are perfect. We need to do much more. We can't change overnight. We can't change mindsets. It requires a revolution. And a revolution has to be a responsible change. Each one of you, or us, are agents of the change. There's no individual, there is no single institution. If this country does need true governance reforms, this country also needs administrative reforms. You cannot be trapped in a system that will be inherited from the colonial masters. It has to be connected with the realities of a complex and diverse country called the Republic of India. That must change. And I agree with the Supreme Court's observations that this should be there. But I would at the same time say this country also needs electoral reforms and India badly needs judicial reforms so that justice is made accessible and affordable to the poor people of the country, to the citizens of the Republic. Today, how many citizens of India can dream of going to a high court or a Supreme Court for justice? Can they even pay? You know the, what the fees are? You guys can pay. An ordinary Indian cannot, cannot get. That's why it must change. The discourse cannot be a fragmented one. The embrace has to be a national embrace of all issues. We have challenges. Challenges are always there in nations. We have a big challenge and a big strength when we talk of the population of India. Two-thirds are young. Our median age is 24. Even by 2040, India's population will remain the largest young population in the world. You'll not reach, the median age will not cross 35. That's a big strength, but that's a big challenge too. How do you connect to the youth? How do you assure them that we are building an India of the future, an India where they have opportunities, an India of which they are proud of? That is a challenge, and that should be the national objective. The national mission of India on the move has to be this. Because we cannot close our eyes. 13 states, the problem of Naxalism. Why? Why there are regions of India left out of the developmental process? Why the infrastructure is not there? Why their children cannot go to proper schools? Why they cannot dream like the children, the sons and daughters, of those who are fortunate to be touched by development. This is an issue which India will have to deal with. And the sooner we do, the better. Now whether we have a system which is moving towards transparency and accountability, the answer would be yes. Can we close our eyes that after the right to vote, the most important right which was given was the right to information? It's your right today. And somebody who denies you information will be punished. It's not just a right given. There are penalties. This is the strength of this country. Two days before parliament functions, when it functions, it functions. There's illuminating discussions. Parliament passed the Lokpal Bill. But let me tell you, <coughs> the issue of corruption will be addressed 
by men and women who have character. You don't need too many institutions, this is my belief. Gandhi didn't need a Lokpal to lead us to freedom and bring the mightiest empire to its knees. But I do respect that there is need. Parliament therefore has taken a view. And the Lokpal will decide. You have judiciary, you have CVC, you have Comptroller Auditor General, and now we have. I feel, why I'm referring to this, the narrative must change. When we talk of India's story and what has gone wrong, it's not a virus India imported, it's a homegrown virus which we have allowed to thrive and we have re-exported to the world, telling, us, telling the whole world that there is something seriously wrong. There may be challenges. Why the positives have not been looked at? That during this period, as Naina was saying, you remained the first three favoured destinations for foreign direct investment. And Ernst and Young now says the best, the most favoured. Any report you see, OECD, World Bank, any investment agency, you are the first three last few years. 136 billion of FDI has come in. When I assumed my present responsibility, as many of you would know, Rajan and Harsh and others, India's exports were barely 160. In 2004, our two-way trade was 130 billion. Today, it is almost 800 billion. Are we talking of that? Have you ever heard a serious discussion on inclusive growth? Have we ever included in the narrative, the deprived? No. Nana referred to manufacturing, and that's correct. Manufacturing is an imperative. Manufacturing is India's national priority. The share of manufacturing in our GDP is 16 percent, stagnant. Not that it is not growing, but mind you, the GDP has also grown. And agriculture is again almost the same. Can agriculture sustain 60% of India's people? The answer is a firm no. There is move towards urbanization. The young people are stepping out. Land cannot be stretched. Opportunities have to be created elsewhere. And opportunities shall, can only be created through the manufacturing processes. That's why India came out with a really futuristic national manufacturing policy which the government put together, and I'm grateful to all, and satisfied that it was done. I have told this story. We thought about it, and I said to my officers, it was in January 2010, when in Jaipur I declared that India will have its own national manufacturing policy. I was wondering why we didn't have it after the industrial policy. Why we did not do it? Because you have 150 million Indians will be joining the workforce by 2025. There's a social dimension. It's not only economic growth. If you don't create opportunities for the young people, it will be difficult to govern such a vast country. Therefore, manufacturing should be India's first priority. Services sector has grown. But there's a skewed growth. We are a global leader in IT. But where are we in electronics? 32 billion is the import of electronics, which we have to put down and start making it ourselves. Whether the chip fabrication, the government has sanctioned huge pro projects to big consortium, where government subsidies uh, to the tune of 27,000 crore will go. We are setting up the IT investment region, which has been declared one of the national investment and manufacturing zones. Now, how are we going to raise the share of manufacturing to 25 percent? This one principal instrument are national investment and manufacturing zones. Twelve of these, 13, plus one, the ITIR I refer to near Bangalore, stand approved. Master plan for eight has been completed and approved. One has rolled out three more of these cities. Eight are coming along the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, will be rolled out before the 31st of March. That's how fast we have moved. 
we have addressed the question of land that Naina was referring to. These are being developed by government in partnership with the states. We have cut through delays. There is effectively a single window approval mechanism put in place. Land will be the equity of the state. Land will not be alienated but given to the industry to create wealth, to create jobs for manufacturing. All the approvals will be in place. This will be integrated, greenfield, self-governed, self-regulated cities of the future India. For the first time, after decades, we invoked one article in our constitution, Article 243 QC. It was invoked by Jawaharlal Nehru to build Chandigarh, and the second city which came up was Gandhinagar. Now we have invoked it to create industrial cities in India. That will change this country, make it a manufacturing hub of the world. We are attracting now investors from major developed countries. Nana referred rightly to Japan. Japan is a big partner in Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, which is referred to as the second most innovative infrastructure project ever conceived in the world, the biggest infrastructure project under implementation. But are we stopping at that? The other one is moving now. Chennai, Bangalore, we have extended it Tumkur up to Chitradurga. We are built, creating the spine where UK is coming as a partner, they call the BMEC. That's the Bangalore, Mumbai Economic Corridor. We are working on Amritsar to Kolkata. And very soon I'm going to move the cabinet for approval for Amritsar, Kolkata Industrial Corridor. I'm sharing with you. These all things have never been discussed, never been referred to. That's my problem. They should become part of India's democratic discourse and narrative. And I would urge the media also that while it's the duty to inform public opinion, it has to be a balanced information. The young people must also know that this country is moving in the right direction, this country is changing, and this country has a future. There cannot be a greater hurt caused to any nation or society if the confidence of the youth is broken, if their faith in the system is shattered. That should never happen. I would say one thing. Just to, before I conclude, that we have, in this difficult period, engaged more with the world. When our wisdom was questioned, we stepped out. 2009, we did a FTA with ASEAN countries. Now the investment and services chapter is also concluded. We signed a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement with South Korea. We did with Japan, a very robust one, with Malaysia, we are negotiating with EU, complex, with the RECs, the regional economic communities in Africa, including ECOWAS and SACU, with Mercosur, with the Andean communities in Latin Americas. Look where our investments have grown, how the diversification has helped. Today, 55 billion US dollars plus Indian investments in Africa. Let's revive.
whether I was wise or not, I said India will host it. September, India hosted 2009, which revived the stalled Doha process. Negotiators returned to Geneva. And it was again in Bali that the first ever, historic first, after the establishment of WTO, we have a pact, is the Bali package, is the first harvest of the DDA, the first trade pact after the conclusion of the Uruguay Round and the establishment of WTO. And I'm grateful to those who came with India. We were able to put together a coalition of countries, of Africa, Latin America, Caribbean. But at the same time, we did talk. Media referred to peace clause. I said in Parliament two days before, and I said in Bali, that it's, we were negotiating a trade pact. We were not at war. So there was a need of a peace clause. It's an interim mechanism linked to the future. We were able to create a mature understanding. And that mature understanding also needed the developed countries, United States of America and European Union. And I'm grateful, equally grateful to them too. Otherwise, the outcome would not have been, it would have been another addition to the failed ministerials. So I'm grateful to all. I knew that we carried the good wishes and blessings of our country with us. Last thing which I want to say to you, references to 2014, democracies always remain dynamic. But India is a land of Gandhi. India is a land which has given wisdom. The original melting pot in the civilizational history of humankind, where all faiths People who were persecuted because of their faith in other countries made India their home. We are home to all religions. We are home to all people. Irrespective of what happens, a strong India will have to be a liberal India. A strong India must be a secular India, one in which our sons and daughters have the courage to dream and realize their dreams. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for those stirring words. Thank you for all your support. May I now request Mr. Sid Birla to give a formal vote of thanks. Honorable Sri Anand Sharmaji, Minister for Commerce and Industry. <coughs> Ms. Nanalal Kidwai, President Fiki, Dr. Josna Suri, Dr. Didar Singh, Secretary General, Senior Officials of the Government, Your Excellencies, Member of the Diplomatic Corps, Past Presidents of Fiki, Members of our National Executive, Fiki Constituents, Business Leaders, Members of the Media, Ladies and Gentlemen. I'm pleased to propose a vote of thanks to Honorable Anand Sharmaji for gracing our AGM. Sir, we greatly appreciate your vision and untiring attention to India's business interests. We value positive voices like yours, which provide balance in difficult times. Our congratulations are also due for your stellar role at WTO. I compliment President Nana for a wonderful year and Dr. Didar Singh for his exertions. Equally, I thank each one of you for being here. Your presence imparts elegance and relevance to our AGM. Sir, may I th share some thoughts for the year ahead? I will probably not say anything that we have not heard before. As we stand on the threshold of a general election, the economy needs... I'll just finish this. I'll just... I'll <laughs> Sir, please, please. Sir, may I share some thoughts for the year ahead? Uh, much of this you would have heard. As we stand on the threshold of a general election, 
The economy needs bold policies and bolder actions. We cannot hope to address the imminent challenges with habitual responses. The key question is how India returns to 8 or 9 percent growth. We recognize that growth is not an end in itself, but the means to meet aspirations of living standards with food, energy, and water security. Sir, India's business attraction, uh, attractiveness is a necessary but not sufficient conditions for an obvious investment destination. Capital readily flows to jurisdictions with a fair risk-reward trade-off and predictable policy outcomes. A key need in the ease of doing business which requires process reform, effective implementation by center and states, reasonable appetite for taxes, and quick judicial or dispute resolution. It is time, perhaps, to consider a sunset point for business rules and laws, reevaluate them for relevance, and scientifically address control Raj in any avatar. At present, businesses and the common man strained, dis uh, face strained disposable incomes, socio-economic disparity, and a weakened social fabric, social moral fabric. As a first step, business and government must re-establish mutual co uh, confidence with society. Good governance and objective enforcement restores moral fabric and allows people to share dignity, businesses to function well, and civil society to be comforted. A propensity to entertain hindsight is counterproductive as it allows aspersions to be cast on past decisions. Greater cultural sensitivity is needed to treat decisions at good, as good faith judgments and not presume otherwise at first doubt or decision making will collapse. Lastly, in our societal context, the disadvantaged need to be supported. Yet, compassionate choices need to be economically prudent in a larger picture. Patronage has potential to distort markets and also discount governance and fiscal prudence. Redistribution to inclusive policies must ultimately be sustained by production or asset creation. We must plan that economic growth generates prosperity with space for individual reward and social equity. Friends, in closing, permit me to glance at the past in order to look at the future. The Japanese say, vision without action is a daydream and action without vision is a nightmare. In this context, it is noteworthy to recall the remarkable vision of Fiki's forefathers. On the eve of India's independence, a group of stalwarts, including my great-grandfather, visualized an economic blueprint later called the Bombay Plan, which spoke for the nation and not just business. It captured the development, uh, developmental aspirations of free India. Even 68 years later, its core objectives are relevant. A multiple increase in per capita income, agricultural and industrial production, accompanied by development of infrastructure. I believe the time is ripe for a similar bold national vision with acceptance across the political spectrum. FIKI works to build consensus on economic policies and will be delighted to participate actively in such an exercise that can speak for India. On this note, may I request this vote of thanks be carried with acclamation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Birla. Thank you for setting the stage and, and mentioning FIKI's way forward in, in various, various areas. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for, for being with us. And